Welcome to the best of the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast. Today, we have a special treat for you as we revisit one of our most popular episodes. In the original episode 204, we pay tribute to the remarkable Northwest Arkansas entrepreneur, Brant Barnes, in an episode titled, Making Every Day Count. Join us as we celebrate the life and achievements of Brant Barnes, who left an indelible mark on our community. Through his entrepreneurial endeavors, Brant inspired countless individuals, embodying the spirit of innovation and determination that defines Northwest Arkansas. We delve into Brant's journey, his business ventures, and the lessons he learned along the way, from his unwavering passion to his commitment to making a positive impact. This tribute episode highlights the incredible legacy Brant left behind. So get ready to be inspired as we revisit this fan favorite episode, honoring the life and contributions of Northwest Arkansas entrepreneur Brant Barnes. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of the best of the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast. Sit back, relax, and let's get started. Cue the music. Hey folks, Randy Wilburn here. I've been toying with the idea of creating a podcast episode Hall of Fame for the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast. I figured I would start keeping track of not only the most downloaded episodes that we've shared, but also the episodes that made the most impact on me and others. While I'm excited to share the first entry into our podcasting Hall of Fame, I am equally saddened by the reason that I'm doing this now. Two years ago, Mark Zweig, who many of you have heard me mention on this podcast, introduced me to a dynamo of an entrepreneur named Brant Barnes. I had the best time sitting down with Brant in his shelter insurance office here in Fayetteville while he told me one story after another, going all the way back to his childhood and ending up at the age of 41 with multiple food franchises, a ton of rental properties, and an extremely successful insurance agency. Brant moved me with his energy and stories. I moved all of my personal and business insurance to him with shelter. The other thing that struck me about Brant was that he was always willing to give of his time and talent to his teammates across all of his businesses and to special organizations. He was definitely a businessman that made a difference in the communities he served in. We lost Brant a few weeks back. He crashed his plane on approach to Drake Field. It was dark, and he was in an unfamiliar plane. That's all I'm going to say for now. I want to share a wonderful letter written by Mark Zweig that serves as both a tribute to Brent and a reminder that every day is precious. After I share this letter with you, we will go right into the original episode 119 of the podcast entitled How NWA Serial Entrepreneur Brant Barnes Found Success in Authenticity. This will be the first entrance into our I Am Northwest Arkansas Podcast Hall of Fame. If you need some encouragement and maybe you have struggled in business or in life, this is the episode to listen to. Please consider sharing this message with a friend. We could all use a reminder of how precious each day is. Godspeed, Brant. Tomorrow May Never Come by Mark Zweig. None of us knows how much time we have, so don't put off making the changes you need to make in your life. On January 6, my wife and I spent about an hour and a half in the office of our friend and insurance agent, Brant Barnes, talking about flying, what makes for a good pilot, a crash he was in eight years before and survived, problems with the alternator on his plane, and how it could function even if it wasn't working. We talked about life, death, life insurance, business, cars, and his plans for this year, which included sailing a boat and going to the Bahamas, among other things, and how this was the year he was going to spend less time working and more time with his family. Brent and I were going to go down to South Fayetteville so he could show me his new business he had just launched. The business is going to provide reconditioned cars to Papa John's, Domino's, and other pizza business owners who offer delivery as part of their offerings. 
He thought he could do as many as 1,500 cars a year for them. I thought if my wife didn't go along, I could maybe catch a ride back to town from him when we were done. But we had to change our plans. A new area representative from Papa John's was in town. Brent is co-owner of eight Papa John's franchises. And Brent had to fly him back to Stuttgart, Arkansas. So we rescheduled for another day. Shortly after 6 p.m., another friend of mine, Bert Hanna, owner of Hanna's Candles Company, and an avid flyer himself, he has his own landing strip at his house, sent out a group text message that read, The plane crash tonight by my house wasn't me. Thank God. Our first thoughts were those of gratitude. But then my wife said, Oh no, what about Brant? Well, a few short minutes later, another person on the list chimed in and said, It was Brant Barnes. I don't think he made it. We were both sick. It was Brant, and he was killed in the crash. The Bonanza plane he was flying was a new one to him. He was a couple miles from Drake Field, had been cleared to land, and then dropped off the radar. Reports from witnesses said the plane was sputtering at about 500 feet, and he hit some trees and went down. We think he was trying to switch to another fuel tank when he crashed. It was dark, and he was in an unfamiliar plane. At the age of 43, one of the most entrepreneurial people I know, a guy who ran seven miles a day, who spoke to my students every year, who gave away hundreds of pizzas during COVID, who spent hours with his people teaching them about business and life, who gave former addicts a chance to redeem themselves, who was a leader in the Salvation Army's quest to feed the poor and homeless, was gone. For Brant, there was no tomorrow. No more time to spend with the people he loved. The moral of the story? Don't put off making the changes you need to make in your life. Don't let the trivial stuff preoccupy your mind and upset you. Do help other people and do some good. Don't put off making things right with people you care about. You never know when your time is up. Sonia and I sure didn't think we would be going to Brant's funeral when we were sitting in his office, laughing that morning. Today is the day that could be your last. Get the most out of it. It's time for another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas the podcast covering the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life in general here in the Ozarks. Whether you are considering a move to this area or trying to learn more about the place you call home, we've got something special for you. Here's our host, Randy Wilbur. Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and I'm excited to be with you for another episode of the podcast. I'm here today with Brant Barnes, and Brant is, he is an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. I connected with him, as I always do, with because through somebody else that I know, and that individual, just a quick shout out to Mark Zweig for introducing us, and I got a chance to sit down and, and chat with Brant prior to us doing this podcast to learn a little bit more about him. And, you know, Brant has owned, he owns He's a Papa John's franchisee. He also owns a lot of real estate and he is a insurance agent. He runs a shelter insurance that's right here in downtown Fayetteville. And so I'm sitting in his beautiful office right off of Spring Street and finally getting a chance to learn a little bit more about him. And I wanted to introduce him to the I Am Northwest Arkansas audience and tell his story to everyone here. And, and as we always do, our focus at I Am Northwest Arkansas is on the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life here in the Ozarks. And hopefully we'll hear a little bit of all of that from Brant as he shares his story. And so without further ado, Brant Barnes, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. Uh, pumped to be here and <laughs> got to speak to Mark's class. That's where this kind of came from. Right. Mark asked me to speak to entrepreneurs in, in at the college and I work with a lot of the kids over there. And I just, you know, I got three classes in a row with Mark and he heard the same stories over and over, but he reached out to you and Just, you know, he, you know, kind of knows I've been in the weeds of entrepreneurship and had my ups and downs and, and, and appreciates that. So, yeah, no, you've been, 
Yeah, you've done a lot. I mean, and, and you're you're short 41 years on this earth and not that I put your age out there, but I mean, you, you mean you're still a lot of life in the tank and a lot more to do, but I'd love for you just to share and we talked about this earlier for you to share your superhero origin story with our audience. And that's the one question that we always ask on this podcast because I believe that everybody's hero's journey is important, but I would love for you just to kind of give us the cliff note version of you know, how you got here, right? I mean, it's not like you woke up one day and all of a sudden we're like, I'm just going to buy some Papa John's. I'm going to go buy some real estate. I'm going to, you know, be an insurance agent. I'm going to be a a pilot. I mean, you, all of these things kind of built on on the other. And so I'd love for you just to kind of give our audience a glimpse into who Brant Barnes is. Well, I think it starts, I think it starts with exposure as a kid, you know, just exposure. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you, what do you know? What does your dad do? What does your mom do? What does your aunt do? What do your friends, parents do? And I grew up in Mountain Home, Arkansas. You know, I'm just just an Arkansas kid. You know, we're 30 miles from Missouri, but what I knew was Springfield, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Memphis, Little Rock. That's what I knew. That's where we went. That's what we did. Dad was an avid Razorback fan, so as you are in Arkansas, we're kind of a one state team, and so we were huge Razorback football fans. And my dad and I grew up flying. My dad was a pilot. He flew in sales for eight years for a company out of Cotter, Arkansas, and he decided after traveling for a long time that he wanted to. He really wanted to settle down and and be around. He was gone two weeks and home two weeks, and that was just not good for, I had two older sisters. So my dad in 84, 1983, 84, interviewed with Shelter Insurance to be an agent in Mountain Home. And it was, let's see, he had a a district sales manager that said, can you come by and interview this afternoon at five o'clock? I'm at the Ramada Inn. And my dad said, I've got my son with me, but I can come. I just, I got my son. He said, bring him. So I was four years old at the Ramada Inn Mountain Home. My dad interviewed with Bob Lewis and they hired him for a shelter insurance agency in 83. My dad started with shelter then, still with them, mm-hmm. planning to retire July 1st this year. Been there 38 years. I guess that's what, that's the math. I think it's 38. Hired a lady named Vicky that was my dad's secretary when she was 18 and she's still there, which wow. is amazing. She picked me up from school, things like that. So my dad was a hybrid business owner. That's what I'd call it. You know, he, he owned his own agency in Mountain Home, shelter insurance and you know, I grew up watching him, you know, he never lost the flying bug. So we flew a small plane everywhere we went. And what I just knew was Arkansas. I knew Arkansas. I mean, I knew Batesville. I knew Conway. I knew Greenbrier. I knew Mountain View. I mean, we all know somebody and and through shelter, it's kind of tight knit. We know the agents in Jonesboro. We know the agent in Batesville. The agent in Cersei is a good friend of mine. And so I kind of through shelter and then through traveling and sports, we played all these teams. So uh, we began to play Rogers and Little Rock Catholic and go to Marion from time to time, whatever. Mostly Arkansas. We never really ventured into Missouri. But, you know, so I grew up, you know, one of my dad's best friends was an older gentleman that was best friends with Eddie Sutton. So he was tied to Charles Ballantyne, was a guy I met when, he, when I was like five years old. Charles Ballantyne stayed at my house when I was six and he was my idol. I mean, he was just the man, you know? And so the older gentleman that was friends with Eddie Sutton had a jet and we used to get to fly and go to games. And then we went to Oklahoma State when he was friends with him. And so, you know, just Razorback was in my blood. Mr. McLean was a businessman. I looked up to him. I wanted, I was like, I want one of those planes. I want one of those. I want to do what he does. And I would ask him questions of how'd you get in the business? What'd you do? And I just, from an early age, I knew I wanted to be a business owner. I knew I wanted to own businesses. And what I wanted was freedom. I yeah. wanted to be able to go anywhere in the world, anytime. And I didn't want money to be a barrier. And I wanted to live a life that's like, whatever I want to do, I want to do it. And so I knew I wanted to be a pilot. I knew I wanted to own businesses. I didn't know what type. I didn't really know where. I just knew that. And so, you know, I played all sports in high school. Did I mean, I played, I was good at everything, great at nothing. Um, <laughs> I could play anything from racquetball to tennis. I was catcher, state championship team. In 1997, won the state championship. Not to veer off, but just crazy how small state it is and small an area. You know, when I came to college, we won the state championship. We beat Sheridan in the finals. And we got in a fight afterwards and it was well known. It was well known. It was a big brawl and but okay. some people got hurt and stuff. I come to college over here and my fraternity brothers, four of them were on that team oh and we all goodness. ended up great friends. And, and, you know, you buy bygones, be bygones. I flew Pine Bluff, Stuttgart and Benton last Thursday and a guy picked us up and it's a banker and he's from Sheridan and his brothers, you know, it's just how, how the state ties together. But I knew I wanted to own businesses. I got out of high school in 97. We had come to Fayetteville for every game. My dad and I sat through every Razorback football game, and that's just what we did. We were here for the game. You know, yeah, we tailgate a little bit, but we were here for who's the player, where is he from, he's from Jinx, Oklahoma, how do we get him, what are his skill sets. We would go an hour before the game and see pregame. You know, we wanted to see him kick and punt, and how's so-and-so looking today. And I don't know, my dad and I enjoyed the game. And so 
that was probably my fondest memories of like Fayetteville, Arkansas was like he and I going to ball games. So I knew I, I, I got out of college or I got out of high school in 97. I went to UCA for a year and a half. I mm-hmm. got a scholarship that, or got pretty much preferred walk on kind of deal at UCA to deep snap. Okay. I weighed 225 pounds at that time. Yeah. Played middle linebacker and deep snapper at UCA. Mostly just it was a deep snapper and met people from all over Arkansas. There was guys from Rogers. I learned at UCA that, you know, those guys are just as big as the guys at Fayetteville. Yeah. They're just not as fast. Right. So they're two tenths slower in the 40. They bench press 50 pounds less and they're about two inches shorter, but they're close. Right. And that was, it was athletic. So we did that for a year and a half. And then I just said, man, I'm going to Fayetteville. I'm ready. And I skipped out that Christmas, I guess in 99, moved back up here and went to school here. What's interesting about this for me is that seeing Fayetteville from, seeing Northwest Arkansas from afar is different. I was from Mountain Home. We flew here, flew mm-hmm. to Drake Field, got a ride to the game and went home. And I knew Herman's, I knew, you know, this, that, but all I knew was that this little piece. Then when you come to college here, okay, now I got Dixon. Yeah. I can put that in my back, you know? Right. And so I'm here and I'm learning Dixon and I'm learning a little bit about it. I worked in Springdale for a guy named Bill Bakewell. It was tied to baseball. In my junior, senior year, he introduced me to Coach DeBrian. I started going pheasant hunting with a bunch of guys, Scott Tabor and a bunch of guys that played baseball. I met Kevin McReynolds and Johnny Ray, got connected with those guys. So like my, it just blossomed from here, kind of my meeting the people from Northwest Arkansas. And so from there, you know, I get out of school in 01 and I'm like, what am I going to do? <laughs> and I think that's the moment where I was just like, I didn't, I just knew I wanted to own businesses. I knew I wanted to fly to work. And I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I wanted to chart my own path. I didn't want anybody in front of me saying, you can and can't do this. Right. And so I really needed out of Fayetteville. I really needed out of Mountain Home at the time. And I was like, man, I'm going to look around and see. There was a friend of mine that wanted to do a startup in Memphis. And they said, if you'll go there, we'll get you started. So I moved to Memphis. I moved to East Memphis and didn't know soul, didn't know anybody over there. It was scary. First time I'd really ventured out where like if my car broke or something or something happened, I didn't really know who to get a hold of. Right. You know, I had connections in Fayetteville. I had connections in Mountain Home, you know, all over the state. But Memphis was new territory. Six months into being over there, my dad reached out and said, hey, there's a shelter insurance agency in Senatobia, Mississippi that is opening up and they'll interview you if you want to interview. And right. there's a guy that's retiring, older gentleman that's retiring. I said, I'll go to the interview. Went to the interview. They hired, they came in, they got me to a second interview. They hired me. And I'm like, where's this? It was 30 miles straight south of Memphis down <laughs> Interstate 55, Senatobia, Mississippi. I took over for an older gentleman that had been there for 32 years named O.C. Burns, and he took me in. He just yeah. took me in and kind of helped me get that going. So from there, I started my venture into shelter insurance in 05, moving to a place I knew nobody. And you know, so, and just, so just so for the audience sake, when you say they hired you, they hired you to run that that agency, right? Yeah. They, yeah. in that situation, you know, shelter owns the, the, the client base. Okay. So they pay off Mr. Burns. He leaves, they put me in charge of, you know, a couple thousand policies. I got a kind of ready-made business and now it's up to me to do whatever I want with it from there. And right. they want me to grow it and add my own team. But you know, I'm an independent contractor and own my own business and I'm in Senatobia, Mississippi. So I start with a little client base and then here we go and okay. we get started. Yeah. And so that started that in 02. And that was new territory for sure. Like I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> uh, I did it for three years, kind of just, that's what I was doing. Now I was buying and selling cars. I've been buying and selling trucks, four-wheelers, anything I can get a hold of since I was 10 years old. I've been reading magazines about real estate and everything. I mean, you know, the ambition is there. It was just like, where do I go with it? So I was buying that. I was buying stuff. I bought a condo in Destin, Florida, one mm-hmm. of the best deals I've ever done in my life. I got lucky. Bought that in 04. It was the first thing I bought when I got the job. I bought a three bedroom, two bath condo in Sandpiper Cove, right in the heart of Destin, held it for two years and was able to really make some money. Just got lucky and got a huge offer and I sold it. I took that money in 05 and my dad was in on it. I'd split it with him, but I bought two rental houses and I, a buddy of mine, good friend of mine that was a banker said, we ought to start a Papa John's. And I'm like, yeah, we should. You know, I'm like, (laughs) and then I'm like, well, hold on. Why should we start a Papa John's? He's like, cause it's really good. Yeah. I'm like, it is good. So let's do it. Right. So it's like myself, this banker, and a third guy. We drive to Louisville, Kentucky. They do the big, I mean, I'm in insurance. I got about three rental houses now. You know, I'm buying and selling trucks. And I go to Louisville, Kentucky. And we come out of this one day. They kind of sell us on the franchise. We were going to put it in Senatobia, Mississippi. That's where we were going to put it. And they're like, the demographics aren't good. You yeah. don't need to be there. You need, if you're going to do a store, you need to put it in Hernando, Mississippi, which is halfway up to Memphis. Okay. A little bit bigger town. But it's right along Interstate 55. This all goes down Interstate 55 sure. out of Memphis. So 
I look at the guys, what do you think? One of the guys says, well, they wanted 250000 pretty much to get open. That's what it was going to take. We needed 75000 cash and we had to beg for one seventy five to borrow. Okay. Because people don't want to borrow money on, fi- on restaurants very sure. much. They just don't. Sure. So one guy goes, I don't have twenty five grand. And I'm like, well, why'd you come to Louisville? You know what I mean? Like, what'd you ride up <laughs> right, here for? Right, the beer? Right. I mean, I guess. Yeah. You know? So he's out. And my other buddy, who's a banker, is a Cenotopia guy. And he says, if it's not in Cenotopia, I'm out. I don't want to do it 15 miles. Up. Okay. So here I am. It wasn't really my idea, but I'm that guy that once you plan it in my head, mm-hmm. it's happening. Yeah. I'm getting a pizza place. Right. So I, I start thinking and I'd met someone. My wife had met a friend from the gym. Her husband, they kept telling us we should meet. So I meet him. His name's Mike Hensley. And we meet and Mike, Mike was, went to school at Southern Miss for architectural engineering, got a four-year degree, came out, worked six months, didn't like it, quit, decided to go to law school at Ole Miss, goes to law school for four years, passes the bar, becomes an attorney, and six months into being an attorney decides it's not for him. <laughs> so he and I meet and he quits his new law job to start a pizza store. Wow. And his wife hated me. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. kind of like, what are you thinking? Like, I, he just spent 10 years in school and now you're going to pull him out to start this pizza gig. So he and I meet, we start talking about how we're going to do this deal. And I'm like, and he's like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. So we start, he's like, they didn't want to borrow, they didn't want to loan us the money. So I'm now stuck at how am I going to get the money? Right. I think this is an interesting story and I have to say it because I, it, it really did chart something for me and in, in learning about mentorship. But I'm kind of, we're kind of stuck. We can't get started. We don't know how to get this store yet because I can't get the money necessarily. I meet an older gentleman in Senatobia, Mississippi. His name is James May. And he was owned about three pharmacies. He had 14 or 15 video shops, 150 rental houses. And just the way it was in a small town in Senatobia, Mississippi, he was the richest man that ever lived. It's small, you know, big (laughs) fish, small pond. I mean, just, they were like, oh, this man's mythical. Yeah. So he comes by my, I called him one day because he had a piece of land that I was interested in buying to put, to build an office for my insurance agency. He comes and picks me and another guy up. We go look at the land. We're done in 10, 15 minutes. We head back to the office and he says, he, another guy gets out of the truck and I just looked at him and I said, Mr. May, I said, I've heard a lot about you. And I said, I really want to be like you. Like, I want to do what you do. And he's like, really? I said, yes, sir. I just, he's like, it's not as easy as you think. And I said, I understand, but like, how'd you get started? If you don't mind me asking, what could I do to be like you? He took the, the drive, put it in drive, and he started driving. And he drove around for three hours. And he showed me everything he bought. And he talked about how he got here. And he told me his story. Mm-hmm. I mean, just from, drove a bicycle from some small town in Mississippi into Senatobia in 1976 and was a pharmacist. And he just told me his story. And we, at the end of that, at three hours, we were sitting there and he said, I got that bank there. They bought from me and I'm, I'm going to build this over here. And I looked at him and I said, man, what I want to do is a Papa John's pizza. And he said, Papa John's, that's my favorite pizza. <laughs> and I was like, man, all right. And he's like, where do you want to do it? I said, they want me to do it in Hernando. He goes, you know, I told you I'm closing these video shops. They were VHS shops mm-hmm. with the tanning beds and sure. he was closing them in yeah. 2005. It's over. He said, I got a video shop right on the on the corner at Commerce, across from Kroger and AutoZone in Hernando. He goes, I'll put the building up as collateral. You and your buddy put 25 in. I'll put 25 in. We'll be third partners. You guys will rent from me there. And he's like, we'll do a Papa John's. And we shook hands in three hours. We shook hands. That was it. He's still my partner today. That'll be 16 years, September 15th. I opened that store in Papa John's, Hernando, Mississippi, the day my son was born, September 15th of 05. And we opened at three o'clock. My son was born at 10 a.m. that morning. Mr. May and I have talked every month for 16 years. He's kind of like a second dad, just a great guy to lean on. And just, you know, he told me, I'm never going to make a pizza. I'm never going to come by there. Right. That's not my gig. Right. My right. gig is to put the capital up and my partner and I's job was to run it. And, you know, he and I have been, you know, just a great guy and, and just do mentorship. And he said to me, you're the greatest partner I've ever had. You're the most hands-off person I've never had really problems with. I've never, you know, and he's still a partner today. He, we're still, that's the only store that we're that way on. I right. don't have any others. But that was 05. It was a couple years. It was a train wreck. The first two or three years of train wreck. I had no idea how to manage people. had no idea what I was doing. At that time, I had 10 or 11 rental houses. I still had insurance going on. I'm working insurance during the day. I'm doing pizza at night and we're breaking even at best. Hmm. We're barely paying the bills because I didn't know how to manage people. I had no idea how to manage people and I didn't know it and I didn't know how to run the pizza business. I didn't know anything about it. It took me three years to figure that out a little bit. I hired a guy to work for me in insurance. So he was selling, I was handing him deals. 
By 8, 9, and 10, we began to really learn how to run the pizza business. By this time, I'm up to 22, 24 houses. I'm still buying houses left and right. I mean, just pulling my hair out, doing 14 things that I shouldn't be doing, buying and selling Japanese mini trucks. I mean, I just keep my eye off the ball. Right. Yeah. And so kind of just to kind of, I'm just kind of going fast and we can go back wherever you want. But so in 2010, we finally got the store making money and we finally felt like, okay, in 08, 09, I'd hired a really good guy named Sean Jenkins to sell insurance for me. I was meeting people. I was handing him deals. He was closing them. We won agent of the year for the United States with shelter insurance in 08. Mm -hmm. And the pizza store started doing well as well. Good at the same time. And you know, that was, we came in second in nine and 10 with shelter insurance, second out of about, I don't know, 14, 1500 agents across the country. And I don't, I don't want this to be lost on anyone. 2008, 2009, 2010 were some of the toughest years, period. I mean, in our country. I mean, you know, I mean, we talk about the financial meltdown, the crisis and everything. Yet you were figuring out ways to excel even during a downtime. Sure. And, you know, I mean, the more aggressive, the more proactive you are, the better things are going to happen. And and you just, you know, so, I mean, and and look, I had 20, 25 houses at that time too. And I had about seven or eight I was flipping and I couldn't sell them. So what do I do? I just rent them, put them on rental, you know, and you just, no matter what happens to you, you've just got to pull it and go, okay, what's next? Okay. Now what's next? I can't change the past. What's next? Right. And I just think that's what's important. And, And so- I learned a lot of lessons right there in that, that eight to 10 range. In 2010, we decided now we know how to do one store. Let's do a lot, which was not the smartest move, but we signed a deal to open Cersei and Cabot, Arkansas, Papa mm-hmm. John's. I had my young guy killing it in insurance. I was checking on him and running that. When we made the deal on Cersei and Cabot, Mountain Home came up for sale. I'm like, well, I got to buy that. That's where I'm from. So right. I bought that Papa John's. <laughs> Hot Springs came up for sale. So I bought Hot Springs. And then we opened Cersei. Then we opened Cabot. So now I'm at five stores. By 2011, I'm at five stores and I'm, so I had gotten my pilot's license out of high school and college. Mm -hmm. And so I was flying at the time. We bought a little Cherokee 180 that I had at Tunica, Mississippi. So that's where the plane was at. And Mm -hmm. we would fly to Mountain Home. We fly to Cersei and we fly to Hot Springs. And that's how we got to the stores and back. So I was living the dream, man. I'm flying to work in my little, little plane. Right. And, you know, don't get me wrong, man. Like I'd be in those stores till 10, 1030 at night, get in the plane at 1115, land at midnight. Mm. You know, it was, it was long, long days. Better than driving though. It was better than driving. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I, you can ask my partner this. We flew so many times from Cersei or Hot Springs back and it'd be midnight. And it was just a place, you know, Tim McGraw says this. He flies a Cirrus SR-22, same plane I have. And he says, there's no more peaceful place than me and my airplane at 11,000 feet because nobody knows who I am and everybody leaves me alone. Right. And he's like, nobody can get me. Even their traffic controllers. He's like, some of them know who I am. And sometimes you can tell they're like, okay, Mr. McGraw, you know, they'll say yeah. it. But he <laughs> said, for the most part, I'm up there away from everybody. And I think sometimes coming home at night in that airplane or these moments where I'm, I'm, cause the lights, I mean, you can see mountain home, you can see little rock, you can see Jackson, Mississippi from 8,000 feet. Right. I mean, at, at night. Yeah. And I don't know, it was just a time for reflection. It was a time to just say, what the heck am I doing here? You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because it was stressful, you know? So 2012, my agent that had worked for me got offered an agency from shelter. Okay. So they yeah, hired him and it. I kind of lost him. <laughs> and when I lost him, I felt lost a little bit. I had mm-hmm. all my eggs in kind of one basket, I think with him. And, you know, it was just that time where I was like, all right, I've been here 10 years, close to 10 years in Mississippi. I'm ready to go back. I'm ready. And I was like, I want to move one time and I want to live in Fayetteville. I don't want to live in Rogers. I don't live in Springdale. I want to live in Fayetteville. It's just something about the place. I loved it. And I just knew. And I told Shelter that I was like, when, if I get a shot, I'll go to Fayetteville. That's it. And it just so happened that in 2012, Bill Shackelford, who was on MLK out by Whataburger, mm-hmm. been here 32 years. Him and Lola May had an amazing agency here. And he decided to retire. And our vice president of marketing called me and said, all right, you're shot you know, Bill's retiring, you want it. And I, of course I said, well, let me think about it. And I got home, talked to my wife and I'm like, we're going, you know, for at that time I could fly from Fayetteville to hot Springs, Cersei, Cabot mountain home, just like I could from Tunica. Sure. I could always go back to Memphis once a month, check on rental houses, check on the pizza business. So that was kind of my philosophy. I'm like, cool. I'll come back. So in 12, um, April of 12, I moved back here and I was able to transfer kind of insurance to here. Still had 25 rental houses down there, had five pizza stores at the time. I get back up here. We moved our corporate pizza office here. So Mm -hmm. everything bases out of here and out bases out of our office here. At that time it was down there. So I got back up here, hired some really good people in the insurance business. We've had an amazing run up here, but probably about 14, I started flipping some houses up here, got in business with some other guys. So, you know, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Mike Hensley, my original partner, 
we're 50 50 on the four stores that are Hernando, Cersei Cabot, Hot Springs. Mm -hmm. And when I got back up here, one of my lifelong friends who I played baseball with, grew up with since kindergarten, Heath Stanley, he and I partnered up and he wanted to get in the pizza business. So he bought my other partner 50% of Mountain Home. And then we opened Van Buren, Muskogee, bought Branson, and bought West Memphis. Had nine stores by probably three years ago, 17, we had nine stores and we ended up selling Muskogee and down to eight. So we have eight stores, 50-50 with Heath on Van Buren, Mountain Home, West Memphis, Branson, and then 50-50, my other partner. Still an insurance business. We've doubled the agency since we've been here. Bought some real estate up here. I've had Airbnb and VRBOs in Mountain View and Destin. I'm a car dealer. I just buy and sell and trade. And if you, there's two things that I think you could, that really determined my life really was what I was into was I wanted a horse trade. Mm -hmm. I wanted to buy and sell and I wanted to flip. I think that's the basis of business in general. It's just a horse trade, just a, I'll give you a sack of barley and you give me two gold pieces and then I'll go trade it for something else. That was just, that's really what was like my passion, you know what I'm saying? For business. And, and, uh, you know, and I'm an Arkansas guy too. Like I, I love Arkansas and that. So that's where I'm at today. We've spent a lot of time in the last three years getting from out of control to organize. Sure. And sometimes like you kind of have to almost pull everything out of the garage to put it back and organize. And that's what I've been doing. So. Okay. All right. So getting back to your story, which has been really exciting and I'm, I'm just getting, I don't know if anybody else is, is benefiting from this, but I'm, I'm taking a million notes here as, as Brant shares with me how he has built his empire, if you will. But one thing that continues to kind of stick out to me is just the importance of relationships. And I'd love for you just to kind of talk about, you know, how you've continued to develop those relationships on a personal, but even on a business level, because it seems like that's that's been one of the key ingredients to your success. Well, the first thing you, you learn about relationships is you think about the way others treat you. That's the first thing I think of with relationships. What do I think of this person or that person and why? Why did I look up to this gentleman? Why did I? Why? And I think that what you find is you've got to be a giver and you've got to give first. You've got to bring value to other people. If you don't bring value to other people, then they don't have any reason to help you, really. And I think that sometimes we we go with a taker mentality. You know, we go to people and say, how can you help me? And then, you know, maybe one day I'll help you too. But if you go to people and say, let me just help you. Let me help you any way I can. What can I do for you? And so I think that, so that that's one is like, And then from there, the minute you meet people, you've got to really study them. You've got to really say, I want to do business with great people. I want integrity. I want, I've always said this. I've really had three partners in my life. My dad, Mike and Heath were really the three people I've ever been in business with. And I've always said that if I can't give you $10,000 and say, Hey, bring it back to me, you know, by the end of October, no contract, no nothing. I throw you a band of 10 grand and I have any doubt that you're going to bring me that money by the end of October. I'm out. Yeah. I'm completely out. I don't want anything to do with this. No matter how much money we can make, it's not worth it. My life's not worth it to live with that stomach ache and worry. So I think that you have to analyze every relationship that you have. And, and you know, I go back, Mr. May, there's a guy named Rhodes Thompson that owned a bunch of AT&T stores and he and I ate lunch every month and he was good. He was good at what he does. He, and he'd always tell me, he's like, do something well and do it over and over and over. Do something well and do it over and over and over. When I met him, he had 24 AT&T stores. Over an eight year period, he grew it to 116 stores and he sold them. He's from Helena, Arkansas. You meet him. He's just, hi, I'm Rhodes Thompson. And he's, he just, (laughs) he is who he is. And, but he's real and he's legit and he was doing it. He was doing it. He was living it. And I was seeing it. Another was my uh, wife's, one of my wife's best friend, Terry Kerr. Um, Terry Kerr is a guy in Memphis that has built like an absolute beast of a business in the rental property business. He buys houses in inner city Memphis fixes them up, sells them to investor and then manages them. And he's just a rock star, man. I mean, just a rock star. And, but what I had to learn was Terry and I would eat lunch once a month for eight years and his business was booming, man, booming. And I always had to think like, why would he want to go to lunch with me? You know, because like, if I go to lunch and I try to sell him something or I try to ask favors from him, right. he's going to quit asking me lunch. Yeah. <laughs> but if in those conversations I can add value then he's going to want to keep going to lunch with me. And I remember one time he used to teach to complain about this girl that were an older lady that worked for him that just didn't do a very good job, but it was like a friend's mom. And he had, he just, and he's like, well, you know, Donna and oh gosh, Donna. And one day I looked at him, I said, man, if you don't do something about Donna, I don't want to eat with you anymore. Cause I'm tired of hearing about it. Mm-hmm. You need to deal with it. And he's like, all right. And so it was about three or four months later. He's like, 
Donna went somewhere else to work. <laughs> and he's like, dude, it was the best one of the, you know, and he's like, yeah. I got this new vibrant person and they're killing it. And so, you know, I felt like I had a val- I value, you know, and, and sometimes I think in the world of when you deal with entrepreneurs and you deal with wealthier people, they're guarded. They're going to guard themselves. You, you, you know, I see it personally. I don't mean this mean, but I, I go to a chamber event or I go to things and it's like, I have to leave because like nine people have already tried to hit me up and trying to sell me something. And I don't even know who they are. Mm-hmm. That's not how you do it, man. Yeah. You get to know me, I get to know you, and then we let business happen naturally. Yeah. And I think that a lot of wealthier, successful entrepreneurs will, they're going to hide in the shadows. You mm-hmm. don't see them just out there everywhere. The ones that are doing it. Yeah. You don't because they're busy and they got a million things going on. But if you can provide value and you can help them, then that's a different story. But I think a lot of people go with that taker approach. Let me, let me go hit this guy up because he has 300 employees and I could get a big lick and make a big sales on this. I'm like, how about this? How about you go get to know that guy, figure out how you can help him. And at some point, ask him or he'll ask you about doing business. And so I think that relationships are hugely important. And I think that it's, but, and it takes time and it takes time. And, you know, you always hear about like the emotional bank account. Like, are you, are you putting debits in or credits? I mean, which one are you doing? Because if your, your account's bankrupt with that person, you're in trouble. Yeah. Because when you go to call on some money, there's no money in there because you've never done anything for them. And so, and that doesn't mean like, you know, quid pro, whatever you say that. Quid like, pro quo, yeah. yeah like, that that yeah, doesn't mean yeah. it's like that. I just mean that like always be thinking like, you know, what value do I bring? What value do I bring to my wife? You know, I mean. I love that because, and if I could add, you know, one of the reasons why I did this podcast was because I like storytelling. I like doing podcasting and it's something that I'm good at, but I just figured I know everybody's got a story to tell. Sure. And that's that's actually what's opened the doors for me to meet so many people because people are always saying, How do you know all these people? And it's like, oh, just because I've talked to them, sure. you know, and I've become friends with people. Sure. And, you know, I leveraged well, leverage was a relationship with Mark, but I've already put in all the credits with him over twenty four years. Sure. So I can make some withdrawals now and it's not I don't feel like, oh man, I you know, I shouldn't be doing this because, sure. you know, he's a mentor of mine or I mean he's a friend, but you sure. know, he's also a mentor. And so I think that's an important message that people need to hear. And and I love being able to have conversations like these because there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast and just listen to any type of information in general in terms of figuring out ways for them to advance themselves and be better. Sure. And I'm doing that. So even just sitting here listening to you is fuel for me to say, oh, OK, here's some things that I could do differently in certain relationships that I want. And if I'm going down the road like you went down and I'm trying to build something, then you know I need to be very methodical about how I do it. And I need to be giving as much value as possible from sure. my end, even if I don't think I have something to give. Sure. And let it be authentic and yeah. genuine. Be and and let it let it find its path. Let it find it. I I didn't. I mean, I, I I didn't like set up this meeting with Mr. May to like try to manipulate him into letting me have an in, a pizza store or, or helping me get started. I didn't. I it naturally happened, right? And yeah. when when he bet on me, I felt obligated to win for him. He put his he put his neck on the line for me. I got you. He told me he wasn't going to make pizzas. He never has. All good, you know. And You know, I think that that's what's important is that you be you, you know, you be genuine, you be authentic and and you truly have the best interest of everybody in mind and let the cards fall where they may. But sometimes we force things and and that's not there maybe, you know, so I think that's what's important is like, be you, be authentic, be genuine and that'll come out. They'll know it. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, again, you know, since we're, it's still in the midst of this at the time that we're, we're recording this, it's March 2nd of 2021. We're still dealing with the pandemic. We're still dealing with the fallout and the residual effects of the pandemic. How have you maintained your business and just maintained what you're doing through this time period? Yeah, it's been interesting to say the least. I mean, we all, you know, it's like uh, that's a nice way to put. Well, it. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's like you know, you we all anybody that's our age probably or where were you when at nine eleven? Right. Know, where were you? You know. Right. It's like. I remember where I was and, and, you know, I think with that, I, I was actually skiing in Vermont when this all last year in February with a good friend and, you know, we went up there and I'm skiing and I'm like, you know, my wife's like, yeah, this thing's kind of growing, you know, and I caught a plane back from, from Burlington, Vermont. And, you know, next thing you know, it's like, you know, and it just was a ripple, you know, right when it all went down, you're like, okay, well, I guess they're not gonna play basketball. Okay. Well, I guess NBA decided they're not, you know, and you know, Tim Duncan or somebody, well, well what, you know, like yeah. it just went nuts. But I think with everything, and not to venture off the subject, but, you know, we had, my dad and I had a plane crash five years ago. Yeah. I remember hearing about that. And as an entrepreneur, 
And I didn't even know this was happening. I think that as an entrepreneur, you've dealt with so many things. You've dealt with so many employees. You've dealt with so many COVID type things and not COVID maybe, but just a lot. And they keep coming at you and they come at you and they come at you. And my dad and we took off five years ago. We were headed to Tunica to stop and then we were going to go on to Atlanta. Got to 9,000 feet. I was flying. My dad was in the right seat. Heath, my partner, and the guy that worked for me, Ross Ingram, was in the back. And the engine started sputtering and it started knocking and started knocking and started knocking and it got worse and got worse and got worse. And the prop froze mid flight, 9,000 feet, single engine plane with no engine. You know, you were in a plane that you know, with 80 gallons of fuel and people is not very long, you know? So you immediately go, okay, what's next? Yeah. What's next? I'm like, okay, I'll go to Marshall, Arkansas, 38 miles. You got 22 miles to go, not making Marshall. Air traffic controller, go to Russellville. So immediately when something happens, you think options, right? Okay. What are my options? My, I can't make Russellville. He's like, turn to Russellville. I was like, I can't, I'm not going toward Russellville. There's too many trees and mountains over that way. And I'm not going to make the airport. I got to find something soon. Found a place in Hector, Arkansas. There was a little road that ran down the street and I, and I just looked at my dad and I said, I'm putting it down right there. And, you know, I've been trained for that. I, I was, I was like, and, you know, I guess it was 19 or 20 when I got checked out in that airplane. And so we're going down in there, we get in and we, we, I was kind of in a good spot to get in this road. But there was a power line you couldn't see till you got there. Oh. Had to make a decision to pull up or go under it. Split decision, make a decision. And I knew if I pulled up, I'd lose airspeed, maybe stall and kill us. I was like, we got to go through it. So I just dove the nose, went through the power line, yanked the power out to the whole community. Right. Hit the ground, right gear collapsed, front gear collapsed. And we just skid down this little county road, down in the ravine, hit a pole and stopped. And I just remember going, I look at my dad and like, I kind of nudged him. Like, you all right? He's like, yeah. I look in the back, they're all right. And I'm like, all right, we lived. I mean, I don't know. I don't think I'm hurt. You know, I'm shock, you know? Right. So, you know, there's some fuel. We can smell it and we're hurrying. We're trying to get everything shut down and get out. My partner, my Heath, he couldn't get the back door open. So he jumps through the front of the cockpit, hits my dad in the head with his elbow, slings open the door and just starts running down the road. You know, he just like, <laughs> I'm gone. We get out of the plane and, and we're out of the plane for about five minutes. And literally my mind went, all right, we're going to need a van or we're going to need something to rent. We got to be in Tunica at so-and-so, Atlanta. We're still fine. We're mm. going to make it. I couldn't even kind of comprehend yet that we crashed. Right. My mind was already on to the next thing. Yeah. And I think that's entrepreneurship. And I think when COVID started, it was like, okay, <laughs> all right, we're in the delivery business. Sure. Okay. We, we don't cook food for the most part. Our food comes off of our make line, goes through the oven. Anything that would be any, on a pizza would be burn off through 480 degrees, whatever. You know, we don't touch the product after it's done. It's in a box that's sealed and we're delivery. We might do all right here. You know, we might be just fine. So we immediately talk to our employees, make sure that they understand where we're at. We start talking masks. I mean, you have to do all those things and you put steps and measures in place. You listen to corporate. All of a sudden, corporate's having a podcast or a little meeting about every week. Here's what we're thinking. And so you just, you just, you shift to that. You know, we go no contact delivery. So we have gone to that where customers can pick that they don't want, you know, no contact. We know delivery is going to spike a little bit. So we're going to have to add drivers. We're that gonna, was an understatement. I mean, yeah. Spike. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. I mean, we knew <laughs> that. And, um, and we knew and we knew that it's a delicate subject with employees. Yeah, you know, yeah. we know, depending on seasons and stuff, we employ 160 to 180 people out of those 180. Let's say I would say 100 to 120 of them are under 21 years old. So you're dealing with youth, you're dealing with lack of knowledge. There's a lot of media that's saying one thing, saying another. You've got to have one uniform message and the leader always has to say, we're going to be all right. Right. We're fine. Yep. You know, we don't have an engine, but we're going to land over here yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to be all right. And we're going to get out of here and learn from it, you know? And I think that, you know, what they can't hear is fear. What they can't hear is you're scared. What they can't hear is unknown. You know, oh, we got it. We got it. Even if you do or don't. I mean, you kind of got to have that. We're going to be just fine. So, you know, we've made a lot of shifts in, um, in people. It's been a tough year. I mean, it has, you know, we, we, one thing with our business is, um, you know, I'm a bootstrap entrepreneur. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I just trying to figure it out. Probably a mistake I made that I, I wish I could have done a little different is we, we, you know, Papa John's grew in the nineties in the early two thousands. And we kind of came into the multi-unit game in 2010 and after. Well, they had already kind of picked out Little Rock, Jonesboro. We couldn't get clusters of store. What you want is eight stores, right? 10 stores in Memphis where you can borrow employees and move food around. Well, we're in Mountain Home. You're Rants, all over the place. I mean, we're all over the place. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. we're a two hour drive to get store to store. Well, the bad about that is if you have a store that has someone get COVID, everyone's around them. Well, you just lost your whole staff yeah. in Hot yeah. Springs yeah. or in Mountain Home. Right. Well, it's not like you can borrow them from another store. 
Right. Right. Well, so that was a negative. So we had a couple stores shut for two or three days, you know, clean things up, figure out who was exposed, who wasn't, get back open. We've dealt with that for a year and that's been tough. And I think the other piece is, but the positive, and this is kind of something I think too, that entrepreneurs have to be able to do is see both sides. Mm -hmm. You have to be like, okay, but wait a minute, by being spread out, guess what doesn't happen? If you have eight stores in Memphis and you start sharing employees and you start borrowing them, then this store gets it and this store gets it. And this spreads now like you got wildfire. five stores or yeah. six stores with it, where when we had one, we're at home for a couple of days, but it's only one of the eight stores. So that was kind of like a, a good thing. Um, so sometimes like the way you're set up can be good. There's pros and cons to everything. And sure. so, but it's, you know, we've had a good year in sales, a really good year in sales. It's been amazing there. I think Papa John's, it was a tailwind for Papa John's. We have a new CEO and John's kind of gone after a couple of years. We've dealt with some of that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes in the franchise world, you deal with things that you didn't do. You know, we are kind of at mercy of what they say and what they do. I'm, sure. I'm a lot happier to have Shaq than John, let's right. put it that way, <laughs> at this point. And I am. And so we got a great CEO now. And, and actually, he was at Procter & Gamble for three, uh, two and a half years yeah. in Bentonville. Okay. So he's he he's not from here, but he knows the area. Exactly. And uh, so he and I, I've gotten to talk to him for about an hour here about a month, a couple months ago. And that was awesome. And I think his direction, along with some COVID tailwinds of sales, I think we're in a really, really good spot, man. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of goes down. I mean, we're, we're still guessing as we go. We were just talking about Branson this morning. We own the store up there. And it's like, what's Branson going to do? Spring break. Like, oh, you I don't know, know yeah. because it's like, yeah. you know, do, is there a real spring break or is there not? You know, I don't right. know. You know, right. been, you know, so anyway, yeah. uh, hopefully that answered. No, it does. It really does. I, I appreciate you sharing that. I was writing down like, because, I mean, you know, just so this idea of always have a, a plan, right? And I, I always think back to Glenn Glary, Glenn Roth. It's, it's a f one of my favorite movies when, yeah. when Alec Baldwin's talking about always be closing. Coffee's and, for closing. It is. Yeah. And you've got to have that mindset that, and, you know, in that closing, it's like you've got to be ready and able and willing to do it whenever the opportunity presents itself. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think, you know, I thought about this earlier when we were talking and I thought, it, I think it's worth saying is, you know, we're talking business a little bit here, right? I mean, yeah. there's culture and there's other, I mean, I get relationships, but when you're talking business, I think, what value do you provide? Right. And I think anyone listening to this call right now, if you work for Walmart or you work for JB Hunt or you work with Shelter or you own your own business, what do you provide? Are you, are you valuable to your organization? Yeah. Because if you're not, I'd worry about your job. Right. You've got, I mean, look, we got to have results. One of the most cutthroat things I've ever seen is an NFL quarterback. They get one shot. They come out of college. There's always a new guy. I mean, mm -hmm. think of all the people always. we've seen, been the Heisman and all this stuff. And it's like they get one and maybe a second shot. Yeah. And what they say is go 24 of 32, three touchdowns and one interception, and we'll give you 10 million. Yeah. Don't do that. And we're going to cut you. Yeah. Welcome to the world. Exactly. Welcome to business. <laughs> it's the way it is, man. I mean, like, it, and I think the quicker you understand that, that sometimes that is the value you provide to a relationship you have with Walmart or JB Hunt or Papa John's as a franchisee, you know, right. and, and it's not all about that, but it is about that. I mean, you know, we sports, we're Razorback fans. I mean, you know, it's been a lot more fun the last couple of weeks Absolutely. than it was yeah. four years ago. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it just is. And, you know, in the SEC, it's like, you know, you better win eight. I mean, you got to, in, in football, you got to win eight. Yeah. Eight's the magic number to stay. Yeah. If, if you're at right. Auburn or you're Miss, it doesn't matter anymore. I don't even, I don't think Kentucky will accept six or seven. Right. You got to win eight, man. You know, so and yeah. it just results. So. Yeah. No. Yeah. You said a mouthful. I mean, there's so much there that I could unpack. I don't, I, I want to be respectful of your time because I appreciate you really taking time to share with this audience. If somebody is listening to this and they're thinking about moving here, what would you tell them just overall, not necessarily from a business perspective, but you could certainly share that as well. But just coming to Northwest Arkansas, what can somebody expect coming here? Because I know in 2014, and the reason why I always ask this question is because when I came here, I didn't know what to expect. As an African-American, I wasn't sure. I mean, Arkansas is a different state. My friends said, why are you crazy for moving to Arkansas? And I, I had no idea. If I knew then what I know now, it would have been the easiest transition of life. But so what would you tell somebody coming here for the first time to Northwest Arkansas specifically? I think that I would say it's the best of all worlds. You know, I, and I say that like you get a little bit of everything. Yeah. We're not a beach town. Right. We're not a mountain town. <laughs> yeah. We're not necessarily a lake town down here, but we have lakes, you know, or we have a lake. And I would have said 20 years ago that, you know, we could be behind times, not as progressive, just a little town in Arkansas. Walmart has taken that away. I mean, we're progressive now. I mean, you're up there with the words of Amazon. You just, 
you get everything. I mean, you, you get cold, you get warm. We got cold the other day. Everybody knows that. <laughs> and then it got um, warm again. Yeah, it and got- it's right back. And, <laughs> and um, you know, the cost of living is awesome. It's easy to get around. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, 20 years ago, you, you pretty much had to go to Little Rock or Springfield to catch a flight or Tulsa. Now you can fly out of here. The last 20 years have developed this place into, you kind of got everything you need. But I'll say this, look, if you're an extremist and you love 10,000 foot mountains, it's not the place for you. You know, you like the beach, not the place for you. If you want a direct flight to Jackson, Mississippi and, you know, Topeka, Kansas, and you want to be able to go to South Dakota right out of XNA, it's not going to happen. Right? right. But if you want to be able to catch a flight, you know, probably get a, a stop in Dallas or Atlanta and get wherever you need to go. We have that. And, and so like you got an amazing aviation community, you got five airports around here. We're growing, we're booming. Like it's just... I don't know. It's just, it's a really good central spot in the U.S. to get, you know, affordable place to live. It's safe. I mean, that's one thing I can say. I have four acres and built a house and like, I'm a guy, I love safety. I, I love just to feel like I'm, I'm, I'm safe. I feel like my community's safe. The yeah. people around me are that way. I think that's here. I just really think that's here. And, you know, I love an SEC town. <laughs> I love, I mean, I look, I was 40 minutes from Oxford. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I was, so I've kind of sometimes feel sorry for the people that live here that are like Kentucky fans. Right. (laughs) Give me a long road for you, man. I'm sorry. It just is. Because everyone here is going to have a Razorback belt. Exactly. Well, I had gone, think about this though. I went to Senatobia, Mississippi, 40 minutes from Oxford. Right. Everybody has Ole Miss belt on. Everybody. Everybody. There ain't nobody not hotty toddy down there. Right. Right. And guess who they had just gotten when I got down there? Houston Nutt. Oh, that's right. So they they took our coach. We kind of, you know, whatever. Everybody can have their opinion. And they're like, we got you, coach, you know. And then, I mean, and and, and I was the Kentucky fan in Fayetteville as the Arkansas <laughs> fan in Senatoga. I got you. But, you know, I tell kids all the time, like, man, the youth here is helps. The youth helps. Yeah. You know, this is, and, and you know, we're the place to be. Like, and you, if you live in Arkansas, everybody wants to get to Fayetteville. Exactly. As kids, exactly. as parents. I mean, so I just think there's a ton of pride. I just love it. I mean, I, I think it's not, you know, again, it's not a big city, but it's not small. Yeah. And that's what I love probably the most about this place is like, there's just enough density to have a Dixon street, but it it's not the crime and the things you might see in a, in a Detroit or Memphis or something like, you know, this, all that kind of blended together for me is I love to drive in every day. I live out by the blessings and I just love that curvy road. Exactly. And I love, I just, you know, I mean, I almost love that I have 15 minutes to think on my way in. So I don't know. I just... It's what I know. I mean, it's it's what I know. And, and you know, you're a Razorback fan and you're from here. And so anyway. Yeah. No, that's perfect. I, I mean, you, you kind of perfectly nailed it in terms of that experience. Lastly, when you're not having pizza, <laughs> where do you go to eat? Where do you like to eat here in Northwest Arkansas? I always like to ask a food question. So, yeah, you know, definitely. and I'm, I'm sure you're kind of a foodie and you like good food. So. I do like good food. You mentioned Herman's earlier, and that was kind of I haven't a been to Herman's much in a, in a while. while. I know no. they're still open though. So, so. I mean, unfortunately, I'm a, I watch what I eat. I run I run sixteen hundred miles, fourteen to sixteen hundred miles a year. Wow! So I run okay. one hundred and twenty to one hundred forty miles. I've run I don't know seven marathons so far. Okay. So I've been New York City and stuff. So I watch what I eat kind of Monday through Friday, and I cheat on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, this sounds bad, but like I love to go to Whole Foods and get a variety of stuff. So yeah. Like, give me some pizza and ice cream because Cedar is cheating. I mean, it's like I could eat a whole box of donuts. You sure. Know? You know, we used, my wife and I would always, when we'd ate pizza, I'm going to give a secret here is like uh, Giraldi's. There's a okay. Giraldi's yeah, pizza. Yeah, no, Giraldi's that is was, good. Yeah. There's a pesto pizza my wife and I used to get all the time and just really love it. You know, I'll give a shout out like just uh, Cosmos, love Greek food. Um, yep. The Cosmos owners are like, that's an owner operated business. And sure. that's what it's all about, man. I mean, they're just, they're there. He's always making food. She comes walking up to us and super nice. And I'm giving a plug to them, but they're amazing. Right. They hire right. great people. I think their food's good. Yep. So we go there quite a bit. Okay. Um, okay. My son loves Angus Jacks. I okay. Mean, it just like one of those things. My son's autistic and he has a gluten free, uh, he has a gluten free bun and a, and a burger with nothing on it, just right. the burger and that and the French fries. So that's a staple. So, you know, we, that's, those are probably my favorites. I'm not a big, big food guy, but like, you know, I'd say Cosmos is our most staple place staple we place, go. Yeah. yeah crazy, I've been you know? there. Yeah. Their fries are amazing and yeah, okay. uh, they are really good. And yeah. their Greek salad, I'm a big Greek salad person. So sure. they put the right salty 
olives on there. I mean, they're just, they're just right. Wife so. loves Indian and we go to, uh, I think it's R&R Curry in Springdale. Oh, R&R Curry is yeah. really good. Mark, so. Mark actually taught me about R&R Curry. I like there and I like Connor Grill, uh, okay. which is also really good, right? Across, which, the, Connor Grill is right almost across the street from Cosmos. Okay. On North right. College. I got to check so, it out. Yeah, Connor, we've had it. One, yeah. Had it yeah Connor Grill's good. So yeah, she yeah. got, I, I, they, I love r and It's good stuff. So. Listen, we've got great culture and we've got great food. Yeah. And you would think, you know, we're in Northwest Arkansas. It's like, are you sure? But I'm like, yeah, I tell people all the time, the food's good. You come here to visit. I'm taking you out. You're going to see, oh, the, no you, you're going to, you know, have a great time. I mean, every time my mom comes here, I take her to Crystal Bridges because I want her oh, to yeah. see that. Listen, yeah. and every time she comes, she sees something new. And I'm like, that's, that's no, what it I is. think something that can happen to you if you're not careful is, is you take things for granted Yeah, and, and you really do once you live somewhere a while. And, you know, we have a place in Destin and I always said I wouldn't move there. Cause I couldn't afford to let, I love the ocean. I love it. I just, I the too. breeze, the smell, the water. We had a boat there for a while. We used to go to this little spot. You'd go out the uh, Crab Island and you go out Fort Walton Bridge and we'd go around to this spot and I could, we had a little cabin cruiser and my son would play inside and we could set the boat in four and a half feet of water. And it was like a Corona commercial. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And you could go to this other spot that was down by Herbert Field, just past Fort Walton in uh, Santa Rosa. And you could park in this little, real, real, like Corona commercial spot. It yeah. was like a little island and you could park right there in four feet of water and the jets would come in to the air for, to the base. And I'd watch the planes and all these things. But I always said that if I lived down there, that I might lose that feeling. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to lose that feeling. So I was like, I'll live up here and, and we'll, you know, we can fly in three hours and plane to get there. And, and you can appreciate it when you're there. Love it. Yeah. But if I got down there, I think I might take it for granted. And I think we do that here is my point. And I, I think. Crystal Bridges is like amazing place that like we just kind of, you know, people travel from all over to come see Crystal Bridges and we don't even go. You know? Exactly. Like, what the heck? I know. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm like, you haven't been there. I talk to people that have lived here and they're like, what? Yeah, we don't go. And I'm like, well, well we yeah. even talk about cost of living. I mean, you know, people, you know, I built a house out where we are and we have a pool and nice and people come out there and, you know, from New York, my buddy from Brooklyn. And he's like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, and, and I'm <laughs> like, it's like not as bad as you think, you know, yeah, I mean, it, right, and, you know, and, right. and, and, and so. We just, you, we kind of take that for granted, but it is. And, and I think the one thing, you know, that has, that we didn't have, and I'm, I mean this 15, 20 years ago is it wasn't as progressive as now. I think, I think we're more of an appeal more diverse. for people yeah, to yeah, move here become, from California yeah. or anywhere else. And that might not have been the case 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and I have to say this one other thing that's, uh, I go back and, and just, you know, the stories and, and just remember, but I met Sam Walton one time and okay. uh, I was young and um, I might've been five years old. And I never forget this. My dad and I went to a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Bentonville. And I don't know why we were there. I was five years old. And we pulled up and I, ne- I will never forget that Silverado. It was like, a, I think it's a red and gray two-wheel drive or maybe mm-hmm. Silverado. It's at the deal. And we walked in and I remember my dad was like, that, that's Mr. Walton. My dad's like, I think that's Mr. Walton. And he was ordering in front of us. And, and at that time, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know. Who yeah, was. yeah, you're fine. And my dad, you know, my, but I was like, I was already thinking business. I mean, right. I was already like, hey, dad, what, what, what can we trade this? And and dad's like, uh, Mr. Walton, this is my son, Brand. He's like, how you doing, young man? And he shook my hand. And I'm never, <laughs> and I have something crazy like around here that you just never know, you know. And to think that we have that much of a titan of business, that was just an old farm boy from right here, man. It's right. so awesome. And, oh, you know, it is. And he was in aviation and he was, you know, kind of, you know, just his story of just rambling and going. That's all I've ever done. It's yeah. just ramble and go. You yeah. know, I bought a car that's boarded five minutes on simulcast. It's just because like, I want to keep that edgy, just sporadic thing going. And I don't know, he had a lot of great stories about that. So, you know, I'll tell this story and then we'll close it out. I, I think that um, when I had read his biography a long time ago, and then I got back and I read it again and I appreciated it even more once I started living here. And I, I, a lot of people, I've told people, oh man, just, just read Sam Walton's uh, biography and, you know, learn about it. And I've, I've run across or run past in the same room with Alice Walton and Stuart Walton and some of the other Walton family members. And, and, you know, it's just, just what they've been able to do with this community is amazing, you know, and it sure. kind of started with them really. And, and it has built beyond their Jones trucking line, JB Hunt, Tyson, and the list goes on and on. And, and, you know, to me, the future is really bright for Northwest Arkansas. Absolutely. And I, I would say, you know, one other thing I would say on that note is, is like, you know, you talked about what could people get from this, you know, us talking today. And the one thing that comes to mind so much is we live in a society that in literally for 20 to 30 years, we've been about building comfort. Yeah. Everything easier, everything yeah. easier. Let's, you know, automatic cruise control, automatic this, automatic this. And where we learn is on the edge of comfort. Where we learn is when we get out of control, where we learn. And like Sam Walton knew that he had to push boundaries. He had to open in Kansas. He had to open here. I mean, 
The guy could have had 10, 15 stores, been a wealthy guy and had a twin engine airplane in Bentonville. And that was it. And kind of called it quits. But like, you got it. Like entrepreneurs get uncomfortable. They yeah. push themselves into territories that others won't. Yeah. And that's not our human nature. Our human nature is be safe, be safe. Oh, be conservative. Oh, careful, 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 careful. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it, they kind of added scare money don't make money, man. I mean, it's, it is what it is. And if they didn't have that ambition and he didn't want to keep it rolling, probably when people were like, could you slow down? Yeah. You have 300 stores. What do you, that's not what it's about, man. Exactly. Like I got more, I got, I want more. I mean, not more money, just more chances, more territory. I want to meet more people. I want to be in California and Arizona. You just have to get uncomfortable. Yeah. You have to. Oh man. That's where, you know, <sighs> you're preaching to the choir, man. I, I love that. I don't know. I don't know about you folks, but but if you didn't get something out of this, you need to rewind this and listen to it again, because Brent just dropped some serious knowledge and some serious information. And I love that quote where we learn is in the edge of comfort. And, uh, you know, I think that is so perfectly true. And I'm going to wrap it up here. We'll probably have to do a part two at some point in time, because I'm sure that Brent's going to have some more more stories to tell in the very near future, because this man is not allowing any grass to grow under his feet. So man, Brent, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. You didn't know me, but you knew Mark and you trusted that. Well, if Mark knows this guy, he must be okay. So I appreciate you taking the time sincerely to meet with me and, and just share your story with the I am Northwest Arkansas audience. So thank you so much. For sure, man. I appreciate, I'd appreciate what you're doing too. That It's huge. It really is. Thank you. I appreciate People don't that. know a lot of these folks and what they're doing. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, everybody's story matters. So, well, Folks, that's another episode of the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast. To learn about us or to read or download the show notes from today's episode, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll be sure to put in some contact information for Brant Barnes. If you want to check out, if you need some insurance and you want to check out Shelter Insurance, you'll be able to do that. If you just want some pizza, you can find out where all his Papa John pizzas are. We'll make sure all of that is in the show notes so that you can check that out. Please continue to listen to the podcast and sign up for our free newsletter to keep up with all things Northwest Arkansas. You can subscribe to the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast wherever you listen to it. It doesn't matter whether you're on Android or iOS, just subscribe. And and please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Obviously, our podcasts come out every Monday without fail. Rain or shine, it's there for you. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and we will see you back here next week with another new exciting episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. We'll see you soon. Peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. Check us out each and every week, available anywhere that great podcasts can be found. For show notes or more information on becoming a guest, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll see you next week on I Am Northwest Arkansas.